Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another week of presentations. Um, I'm Alexandria Williams with the Willow Domestic Violence Center. I am the Prevention Specialist at the Willow. And if it's your first time joining us this week, um, I always like to just say what I kind of do. So I give presentations to different groups of people ranging from about third graders all the way up through high school, as well as college students and adults um, about healthy versus unhealthy relationships, teen dating violence, and also um, DV 101. So if you're interested in, in having um, and participating in any of those presentations, um, or would like for me to do a presentation for an organization you're part of, please feel free to email me at awilliams at, dv, at willowdbcenter.org. Again, awilliams at willowdbcenter.org. So again, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're gonna be talking about domestic violence and the relationship that it has with um, technology. So we're gonna be just covering the basics of what digital abuse is today, as well as um, the different ways, the different types of digital abuse, the different ways that abusers will use technology to, um, to abuse a survivor um, and ways that a survivor can protect themselves from this as well. So if you have any questions for me, please feel free to email me also. And I am always glad to have conversation about um, the content that we're talking about for the day. So what is digital abuse? Um, we've talked about a lot of different types of abuse, such as physical, emotional, verbal. Um, but we haven't really talked about digital abuse. And it's not really talked about that much, even though it is really prevalent in this day and age, especially due to the um, enormous amount of technology that we use. So digital abuse is the use of technologies such as texting and social networking to bully, harass, stalk, or intimidate a partner. Um, in most cases, digital abuse goes hand in hand with emotional and verbal abuse which again does not make them any less important than physical abuse. All forms of abuse of abuse are so important and can have such um, a, a great negative and traumatic impact on the survivor's life. So even though this abuse is happening online um, and we would like to think that our online lives are separate from our in-person lives, that is just not the case. So. A lot of things that are happening online, digitally, through technology, do have um, a huge impact on survivors in their real life. So some important statistics that we're going to look at real quick before we dive in. Um, so this is a survey that was done by the National Network to End Domestic Violence, and they have um, and a chunk of their services are geared towards how to make technology safe for survivors um, when they are in abusive situations. And so they sent out a survey to um, a number of different agencies, domestic violence agencies. And so this is kind of the, the results that they received back. So 79% of the agencies reported that um, they had survivors who had abusers that would monitor their social media accounts. 74% um, said that abusers check their text messages. 71% said that abusers scrutinize the survivor's computer activities. Um, and they found that 96% of the harassment that was happening from abusers to survivors was through texting. Um, which doesn't really shock me too much just because a lot of a big population um, of our society has smartphones, we text, um, and so um, it's really no surprise that this would be the biggest, this would be the highest statistic that we have um, of how they are being harassed. 
86% reported that abusers harass survivors through social media, so a little lower than texting, but also pretty high compared to the other statistics, which again, not very surprising since so many people use social media. I know there's billions of people who have at least Facebook. Um, and so Facebook, having social media does make it easier for abusers to, um, to follow and watch and comment and send messages to survivors as well. So there are some key types of digital abuse that happen. So we're gonna go through those um, real quick. So stalking, um, more specifically cyber stalking is what we're talking about. Um, but stalking is a pattern of behavior where unwanted attention, harassment, contact, or conduct causes a person to feel fear. Um, so looking at it more from the technology stance, we see that abusers are um, using smartphones to track the survivor through GPS. Um, they're using social media to also track survivors, often to watch what the survivor's doing, see who they're with. Um, and we often, I mean, when we post on social media, and we'll talk about privacy settings um, in a little bit, but for some of us, we don't have any privacy settings. We, um, what we post, everyone can see. Um, and it is pretty common to tag your location. So if you're checking out a restaurant, like I just got done eating at Encore and you tag, your, you tag Encore in that picture, then the abuser is able to see where you're at right at that moment, who you're with, what you're doing. Um, and so social media has made that a bit easier for them. Um, video, audio recording, or other devices to monitor. So might be um, recording the survivor to um, kind of watch where they're going, might be following them and recording, taking pictures of them, might have some type of um, system, some type of spyware on the survivor's phone at times that allows them to listen in to any conversations um, that are happening or a, or in some cases, some abusers have actually tapped into like the cameras on a laptop, the cameras on the phone to kind of watch what the survivor is doing. Um, and they do this to intimidate and control the survivor. So in some cases, the survivor is aware that the stalking is happening, but in other cases, um, they do not. And so this abuser might use this against them to try to get them to, con to try to get them to do whatever they are wanting them to do by saying, well, I've been screen recording you or I've been tracking you on my phone and um, other things like that to, to try to intimidate them. Next, we have relentless texting and calling. So abusers um, are trying to stay in contact with the survivor constantly. And as we know, um, that one of the most popular tactics that abusers will use to gain power and control over, over a survivor is isolation. So cutting them off from friends, family, um, maybe even any coworkers that they're close with. And so one of the ways that they um, try to implement isolation when talking about technology is let's say the survivor has left the house and they're going to go spend some much needed time with some friends. The abuser will sit at home or wherever they're at and will constantly be texting them, constantly be calling them. Um, and they're doing this on purpose. They're doing it to cause a distraction. Um, they do this to bombard the survivor. Um, and interrupt their time that they're spending with their family or friends. And this is so important because um, when I was researching this, I read that uh, I read um, a statement from a survivor that was saying like, she just stopped hanging out with her friends completely because every single time they would get together, um, her abuser would send her hundreds of messages, would call her tons of times. And so she finally came to this point where she was like, I'm just not going to even go. I'm just going to stay home because I don't want 
to have to go through that. I don't want you having to call me all the time. So I'm just not going to go spend time with my friends. So what we're seeing there is a perfect, perfect example of an abuser um, successfully isolating the survivor now because um, the survivor is would rather stay home than have to deal with all of the um, all of the the different distractions they're going to have to face um, and the diff and all the tension that would be occurring if they were to spend time with their family or friends. On the other hand, we see that um, some survivors will go out and spend time with their friends and family, but the abuser has made it a strict rule that they are to pick up on the first call. Um, they are supposed to respond very quickly to texts, not take too long, or they will be punished when they return home. Um, and so this, I mean, having to constantly be kind of walking on eggshells, having to constantly be checking your phone to make sure you're not missing any calls or texts is a lot of anxiety to put on a survivor. And so again, we might see them instead of, instead of going out and spending time, just going ahead and staying home with the abuser. Um, so that way they, they don't have to experience any of that while they're out and about. Next, we have monitoring, um, controlling over social media and communications. So in a lot of cases, abusers do require um, that they have full access to a survivor's, um, to any communication of the survivor's using. So this could be email, text, um, phone calls, any type of social media you're using to talk to people. So maybe your private messages on Facebook, your DMs on Twitter or Instagram, they want access to all of it. Um, and there's really no good reason for you to have all of your partner's information like that and constantly be monitoring their communication. Because as we know, and as we've talked about, in a healthy relationship, there is, a, there is trust. Um, and whether this these actions are fueled by jealousy or lack of trust, both are unhealthy, both are red flags. So if your um, partner is trying to convince you to allow them to have all your passwords, allow them to read all your emails, your texts, um, there's obviously something not right there. And so definitely a big red flag to watch out for. Um, it's also common for abusers to just not let the survivor have any type of social media at all. Um, but again, if they do, then they do go ahead and usually ask for the passwords and access um, for those accounts. Next, we have video and audio recording. So um, regardless of whether or not the survivor has granted permission to be recorded or photographed, the abuser can use certain pictures, certain videos, certain audio recordings to punish um the survivor so these different recordings i mean it could be anything maybe you said something about someone and they caught you on camera or maybe you're doing something that's just kind of private to you um it might be embarrassing for other people to see and so they might be threatening kind of to post it to post these videos these recordings these pictures online um if you don't given to what they're saying and they might also use them to um, produce some shame for the survivor and what we're going to talk about next um, revenge porn is ties very much into that video and audio recording so um it is totally okay if you and your partner are wanting to record or take pictures of your intimate moments together that is totally up to the two of you. Um, but in this specific case, a lot of the times we're seeing that survivors have no clue that they are being recorded or they have been coerced and manipulated into allowing the abuser to record them or take intimate pictures of them. Um, and so what abusers will do is they'll get these videos, they'll get these pictures, and they'll usually do one of two things. So the first thing being, sometimes while the relationship is still going on, the abuser will go ahead and post these. Um, 
not to not to um, coerce the survivor into doing something they don't want to do. But in this case, when they're posting it while you're in the relationship with them still, it's usually to cause the survivor humiliation um, or shame. Those are the only two things that the abuser is really wanting. And a lot of times, even after they have posted these very intimate and personal recordings, pictures, they will find a way to gaslight the survivor into thinking that, well, you shouldn't have let me take them. You shouldn't have, you should have made sure I wasn't recording. Um, They'll say things like that to make the survivor feel like, um, to invalidate them um, when they're obviously upset about their privacy being breached. Um, An abuser might also use these recordings or these pictures to um, threaten the survivor, to convince them to stay in a relationship if they're wanting to leave, um, if the survivor is exhibiting some behavior that the abuser um, does not like, does not agree with, they might threaten the survivor. Well, if you don't stop doing this, if you don't stop making me mad by doing this, I'm going to post this. I'm going to send this to your family. So this is something very real that happens. And so it's so important that we are aware of this and that survivors are aware that this is happening as well. Um, so next we have spyware programs. So spyware programs are typically marketed to parents to um, as, a, as a way to monitor their kids' phones or their computers um, as a way to keep them safe. So abusers are using this spyware, these spyware programs on survivors' computers, on their phones to be able to track them, um, record what passwords that they have for their different accounts, to read um, their emails, maybe even intercept some emails so that the survivor isn't receiving maybe an important message. They use this to read their text messages, to see what websites they've been to. Um, So this could be, so an abuser might put this on um, a survivor's phone for multiple reasons, such as maybe they think the survivor's cheating um, and they're jealous. Maybe they wanna see if the survivor's planning on leaving. Um, leaving them, if they're making plans, stuff like that. So this is very common as well. Um, So this is something I wanted to include because I found it very interesting and I haven't really heard a lot about this, Um, but um, there was an article talking about how abusers are now using smart home tech to um, control survivors. So Smart home tech is basically, I'm sure a lot of us have seen it, where you can control the temperature, like your thermostat at home, you can control your lights, your refrigerator, your door locks, all through your phone, um, all online. And so this type of technology is used in about 29 million homes. Um, and when it's usually installed in the home, it's, it's most likely always installed by the abuser. So what survivors are seeing, what the hotline is receiving calls about currently is that um, when a survivor breaks up with the abuser, when they leave, um, and maybe the abuser exits the house, that the abuser still has the passwords for this te- technology in the house. So there are survivors who are sitting at home Um, and their abuser will turn their heat all the way up, or their abuser will shut off all their lights, um, or they'll cut off their internet and TV because they have access to it. Um, There's also survivors who are still with their abuser living in the home, and the abuser might be at work, and the survivor might be at home, and, um, and the abuser might also be doing multiple of these things, as a way to show the survivor that they have the power and the control, which we talk about a lot, because that is their main goal. Um, So the problem with this is that our legal system, because we, I mean, we know about protection orders, um, that the legal system hasn't quite caught up with the technology. um, And they're trying to determine, they're trying to, to distinguish in like a case of a protection order, if a abuser turns the lights off, if they turn the heat all the way up, 
does that count as a violation against their protection order since they aren't actually in that space with the survivor? So that is a barrier that they're seeing with this new form of technology. Um, I thought was very interesting and very informative to bring attention to. Um, they also have found that survivors who have tried to remove this technology from the home, like just get rid of everything, um, this action usually results in an escalation um, and upsets the abuser, which we know automatically puts the survivor in danger. So again, there are multiple barriers um, when we're looking at this specific type of digital abuse. So some popular patterns that we see um, with digital abuse um, was flooding the victims, email box with emails so as to disrupt their ability to receive any incoming emails, sending intimidating emails, texts, or instant messages, um, monitoring the survivor's computer communications through the use of software programs, such as spyware, which we talked about, um, taking on the survivor's identity to send false messages or to purchase goods on the internet, using the internet to obtain personal information about the survivor, um, impersonating the survivor through email and social networking sites. So if you're seeing any of these things, again, red flags that you are in a digitally abusive situation. So I just wanted to list some like actual real life examples um, to have a better, so people can have a better um, understanding of maybe what it looks like. So if they're telling you who you can or can't be with on Facebook or any other social media sites, um, if they're sending negative, insulting, or even threatening emails, um, Facebook messages, tweets, anything like that online, um, if they're using Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and other social media to keep constant tabs on you, so checking it many times a day, always wanting to know where you're at, who you're with, what you're doing, um, if they're sending unwanted explicit pictures and are demanding or trying to coerce you into sending some in return. Um, if they're putting you down in their status, post, tweet. If they steal or insist to be given your passwords, if they're constantly texting you and make you feel like you can't be separated from your phone um, for fear that you might be punished. If they look through your phone frequently, checks up on your pictures, texts, and outgoing calls, or if they tag you in any unkind or inappropriate pictures on Instagram, Tumblr, etc. So those are just some real life examples of what this might look like um, in the day-to-day -day life of a survivor. So the biggest barrier that we see with digital abuse is that it is very difficult. Um, officers and state attorneys are saying it's just really hard to prove um, the abuse when it's digital, when it's digital, because it's hard to prove that it's actually the abuser sending um, sending those messages. In some case, it might be the abuser made a fake profile and they are harassing the survivor that way. Um, so it's just really hard to um, to prove that this abuse is happening, as well as it's hard to prove emotional abuse is happening and things like that. But as we know, we know what's going on. Um, and so, but it is important that survivors are aware that that is a barrier if they are bringing it into a, a court environment, that that is something that they might have to, um, might have to hear about, about the lack of proof. So we all have digital rights. Um, and if I'm gonna read these off, and as I'm reading these off, if you feel like you don't have this right currently, you feel like this right is being violated, that is a really good sign that um, the situation you are currently in might be abusive, might be unhealthy. Um, and we're going to talk about some ways to kind of protect yourself as well. So you have the right to turn off your phone and spend time with friends and family without your partner getting angry. You have the right to say no to sexting or sending pictures or information digitally to your partner that you are not comfortable with. You have the right to keep your logins and passwords completely private. You have the right to control your own privacy settings on social networking sites. And you have the right to feel safe and respected in your relationship, whether it's online or offline. So for every relationship that you're in, for every situation that you're in, um, I want you all to remember that these are your rights. And I know sometimes it's hard to um, 
maybe detect them or maybe pick up that your rights are being violated. Um, so I hope that you guys will write this down or keep them in your mind and be able to look back and say, hey, like, I don't feel, I feel like if I turn off my phone right now while I'm with my friends, my partner is going to be very angry, angry with me and I'm not going to be in a safe situation because um, that should never have to be the case. Um, so some different ways that you can protect yourself. So avoid using any old computers or phones um, that you might have used while you were in a relationship with the abuser because there is a chance that the abuser has downloaded spyware removal software or spyware, spyware software. The good thing about spyware is that you can pay to have it removed, but the bad part is that you have to pay, unfortunately. Um, and so for some that might be easier to go ahead and pay for some it might be easier to just go ahead and get a new device a new phone. Um, disabling or removing any geolocation apps when downloading new or reinstalling apps. Um, please carefully read what permissions you are giving to each app. There are many apps that we have on our phones that allow us to be tracked. Um, and that show our location, especially if we're using the app. So there are settings in your phone um, and your laptop that you can um, change that will make it so your location isn't being shared. Um, also change all passwords and pins immediately following um, the ending of the relationship or if you have just left or even if you're getting ready to leave, going ahead and changing all of those different passwords and pins to your account so that um, they won't be able to breach your account. I'm creating new email accounts um, for communicating with friends and family and creating a separate account for um, your financial accounts is another way to protect yourself. Um, if you have any existing social media accounts, going ahead and changing your password and also changing your privacy settings. Um, there are, for Facebook I know specifically, they have really good privacy settings that allow people to literally not see a single thing on your page, and not even your profile picture if you don't want them to. So um, I would encourage you to go and check and just see what the state of your privacy settings are, because a lot of people really don't know about them at times. So I would encourage you to go look at them and change them to what you're comfortable with. Um, when posting photos or status updates online, disable the location feature, as well as do not tag your location. Um, and also do, don't tag people in your pictures if you are not comfortable with your abuser possibly seeing that picture and trying to contact the people in your pictures to get to you as well was something that they listed. So um, just being mindful of that. Um, if you have, um, if your abuser is listed as any type of contact, whether it's medical, financial, um, through childcare, contact them immediately and let them know that you no longer want your information to be shared with that person, especially when we sign release forms for our family to uh, be notified of our, um, of our medical records, things like that. Just go ahead and update that and block them from being able to um, access that information, that private information. Um, and lastly, go ahead and notify your friends and family and coworkers that, um, that you would really appreciate if they would not share or provide any information, private information about you to your abuser, especially things like where you're at um, and even maybe even your work schedule. So lastly, some benefits of technology for survivors um, is that the internet does allow some online assessments of violent relationships. So being able to go online and maybe just read some information, um, fill out fill out maybe a quiz or something to see how um, unsafe your relationship is. There are resources like that, which are awesome. Um, educating survivors. So if you don't really know that lot about domestic violence, being able to log on and, and read that information. Um, information about um, how to receive services, domestic violence services, um, online support groups, and also being able to read the different stories from fellow survivors can also be so empowering, which is something that happens online as well. So technology isn't all bad. 
Um, there are great parts of it, helpful parts of it for survivors, but today, yes, we did kind of focus more on um, the negative aspects and what you can do to kind of um, protect yourself from those. So that's all I have for you all today. Thank you so much for um, tuning in and learning more about domestic violence and technology. This is our hotline number. It's 24 hours, seven days a week, um, 785-843-3333. Please call if you're needing any type of assistance, if you have any questions about services, um, if you need to talk to anyone about maybe some um, violence that's happening within your own home currently, please feel free to call and an advocate will be um, available to discuss that with you. Um, as well as this is our, our website, um, willowdvcenter.org, and there's a lot of other information on there about resources, services, um, and COVID-19 current stuff going on right now. And that's all I have for you all today. Thank you so much.